This morning, this morning's scripture I saw as a memory verse on the little video that we saw. So here's the here's the deal. We all know this scripture. You will all have to learn it before you go out the door because there's children waiting with big buckets of water out there. For those who don't know it, but anyway, it is it, it is uh, Jeremiah 29, 13, and we all know this scripture, and it reads this. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. This will be better. I'm going to use the handheld. I don't know how that uh, will work with you filming. I might move around a little bit. I'll try not to go as long. I know it's a little warm out there. I was just sitting and uh, we've had kind of a full service already. But the good news is, despite all the air and the seat within our media, God's truth is still marching. God's truth is not going to stop. And one day the world will know uh, God's truth, the way, <laughs> the truth, and the life. The truth that will set us free or could have set them free, uh, should they so desired. Um, this summer, I've been gone for about a month from... Uh, here, I feel almost like a stranger in my own church, but I had two uh, camp meetings back to back, then we had ministers meetings, and then we had vacation Bible school, and that week I was down in Jasper, so it is good to be back home. Uh, one of the highlights of my summer was spent in a farm field in Kentucky. You might say, well, what would be such a highlight going to a farm field in Kentucky? Well, in Williamstown, Kentucky, there's a great big boat, and uh, it took them several years, I think, to build that boat. Uh, they built it a lot quicker than Noah <laughs> built his boat, but uh, I've always wanted to go see Noah's Ark. And so we drove out to see not the original Noah's Ark, but a boat that uh, is as big as Noah's Ark, and supposedly they tried to do it as close uh, to the actual uh, requirements that God had given Noah to do. And it was amazing as they were driving us up to the Ark to think, wow, this is big. And I said, how many people come through here every day? And he said, anywhere between two and 8,000 people. And there were quite a few people going on to the ark that day. I don't know how many people toured Noah's ark when he was building it back in Bible times. The Bible doesn't say. I don't know. There may have been some people who poked their heads in out of curiosity. They would have had to have done it before the door was closed. But while it was still open, there may have been some people just to look inside out of jest and, and mockery to say, look at this. What a crazy thing this guy is doing. And uh, so as I toured this great big boat, uh, certainly some of the things wouldn't have been on Noah's Ark. They had uh, Noah's Coffee Shop. I don't think that would have been Noah's Ark and some kind of olive cafe. And they had zip lines going past the Ark. And I thought, well, some of these things probably weren't at Noah's time. But they weren't building it for a flood. They were building it for amusement. It was built for amusement. What do you think about when you think of amusement? Now, I'm sure as people are getting amused, hopefully some people are actually considering and thinking about the Bible story, but primarily that is built as an amusement park. And they actually, before building it, went and toured some other amusement parks, even some of the Disneyland parks, to figure out how can we make this a park that people will want to come from all over the world to check out? And uh, how can we make a profit off of this park? I don't think Noah was trying to make a profit off of his his boat. He was trying to save life. In fact, Noah was spending most of his money, uh, all of his money, matter of fact, to, to build that great big boat. As I left that day to head back uh, to our uh, motel rooms for the NAD meetings, I just started thinking, I wonder if it was going to flood today if I would have gotten on that boat. You had people from all over the world, and it's easy to say as a, as a Christian, oh, yeah, I would have been on Noah's Ark. I would have gotten on, but would you? Really, the guy who built this, he's a Christian. He's a creationist, has a big creation museum. But if he would have gotten up today, he's like, God has told me, you guys are going to get on my boat. It's going to flood, and this is the only safety. Would I have gotten on? And I said, well, you're crazy, man. I'm not getting on this boat. I've got a church to get back to. I've got you know, a house to get back to. I've got uh, a life to get back to. And then I thought, you know, Noah preached for 120 years. 120 years. And I'm sure some people are like, you said this 40 years ago. You said this 80 years ago. You said this 120 years ago, Noah. I want to take you to the story in Genesis chapter 6. We're not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to read a verse. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3. 
And I will challenge you to read the story again because I'm not going to take the time this morning. I, I did a lot more reading this afternoon. I'm not because we have a full house and a lot of kids. And I'm not going to take 40 minutes this afternoon like I took this morning. I'm going to try to take half that time. But in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, God says this. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. So God strove with the people of Noah's time for 120 years. And I'm sure each generation, the kids got more wicked, and their kids got more wicked, and their kids got more wicked, and their kids got more wicked, to the point where there weren't really any godly people left on the planet except for Noah and his family. The only thing that they did when it came to talking about God was to joke about God and to mock God and to mock Noah and his family. And God said, my spirit's not going to strive with man forever. Now, this is a verse we can take to heart today. This is a verse we can take to heart today. So Noah worked in that boat for 120 years, and I thought, man, how in the world, even in 120 years, could he build something? I couldn't even build an Amish cabin probably in 120 years, and Noah had to build this great, big, huge boat. But then again, I thought, too, it says that these were the days right after that. In verse 4, it says there were giants in the earth in these days. They were men of renown. It wasn't like Noah was a little pipsqueak, a little guy, and all the sinners were giants. Noah was a big man, too. Back in the days before the flood, men were bigger. Animals were bigger. So you probably had a 14-foot guy. I don't know exactly how big, but 12, 14 feet, a really big guy. And his sons were really big. And the wicked men were really big. And they had really big animals, and he worked, and he worked, and he worked, and 120 years later, he completed it, and it was their last chance. God's spirit wasn't going to strive anymore with people. And I thought, why was it that only eight people got on board? Walking that boat could have held way more than eight people. We had thousands on board. We had thousands on board, and many of them were, were in electrical wheelchairs and, you know, driving through. They had a theater there on board that people were sitting down and watching. I thought, you know what? Why only eight? There's so much more room. And I was sad. And again, I thought, well, would I be on board? Would my family be on board? I don't want to say this today. Was Noah a failure? Was he a failure? You know, I would think if I came to church next week and there was only eight people here, would some people say, what a failure. Only eight people are coming? Only eight people. But I'm going to say this today, Noah was no failure. It says that Noah actually was perfect in his generation because he walked with God. And it wasn't the, necessarily the, the boat that Noah built that saved him. It was because Noah obeyed God. His obedience was the key. His obedience and listening to God and doing things exactly how God said. And it wasn't just him, but his family listened and obeyed too. And then it says in Genesis 7, guess who shut the door of the ark? Did Noah do that? And that's one thing I didn't like about it. The ark door was kind of little. They had a couple, you know, 12-year-olds there standing next to it. I thought, these 12-year-olds could shut this door. But in the Bible, I'm sorry, Noah, this big guy and his sons that were also big, they could not shut the door of the ark. They could not shut it. Only God could shut the door to that ark. So who was it that sealed Noah in? God. And we're going to look here because this story is parallel to about what's to happen on our earth today. And I will say this. If you're a parent here today and have kids, your kids are your first priority. If the whole church is lost but you and your kids make it, you are no failure. So as a pastor, as elders, as grandparents and parents, our kids are our first priority. Noah only got his wife and his kids and their wives, and he was no failure. I thought, think about if we got to heaven and we have other people that are there that we love from church, but our kids aren't there. How heartbroken we will be. Uh, keep praying for your kids. I don't know where your kids are at. Some of you have kids that are as old as me now. Pray for them. Plead for them. Um, some of them have gone so far, but I will say this. The Holy Spirit is not done striving yet. We're going to get to this verse. The Holy Spirit, there'll come a point in time where he stops striving, but while he is still striving, 
pray like you've never prayed for the Holy Spirit to convict their hearts. Because I'll tell you what, if you got to heaven and your kids are there and your grandkids are there, heaven will be sweet enough. To sit down next to Noah and have Noah tell you the story with his kids and you and your kids, it'll be sweet enough. And yes, do I want every family in this room today to be there? Absolutely. But my kids have to be my top priority too. I've got to make sure at home that I put the time in to say, man, I know I'm so tired of doing prayer meetings and after being with people all day, but I've got to make sure that I have family worship with them so they're ready. So what is it that will seal us in? I'm going to take you to a verse in Isaiah because another flood is coming to our earth, not a flood with water. And I'm going to get a couple other passages as you turn to Isaiah um, Isaiah 59, verse 19 is a text I'm going to have you look up with me. We're going to... Uh, leave out. Did, did you put this, did you film this morning's sermon by any chance? You did not. I was going to say for those of you who wanted to get the really long version could go this morning, but a couple passages we read this morning would be Matthew chapter 24. You've read that before and it deals with as in the days of Noah, so it'll be before the sun, coming of the son of man. And also second Peter chapter three, read through that because it talks about how there's going to be scoffers and mockers in our day, just like in Noah's day saying, where is this coming of the Lord? You've been preaching about this forever, Adventist Church. You know, the Adventist Church was founded in May 21, 1863, the first general conference we founded that, that day. Almost 160 years ago, 160 years ago this next May, the Adventist Church will have been in existence. Noah preached for how long? 120 years. Now, the second commandment talks about how God has a limit in which he will strive with people as well. He tells in the second commandment that, look, God is not going to strive forever, but he will eventually bring forth judgment to the third and fourth generation. Noah went to the third generation. The Adventist church is in the fourth generation. And we know that judgment starts where? With God's people in the house of God. Now, what is this flood about to come on the earth? Isaiah chapter 59, verse 19 it says, so, they shall, uh, so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. So from the east to the west, God's people are going to fear the Lord. And it says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, what's the next flood going to be? It's going to be the powers of darkness that flood our earth. When God allows his four angels to stop holding back the winds of strife that we see in Revelation chapter 7, the angels are allowed to let go and Satan's demonic forces flood the world. There's nothing holding them back anymore. What is going to be our protection when darkness floods our earth? Here he says this, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. The Spirit of the Lord will no longer be striving with wicked men, but the Spirit of the Lord will still be using us. He will raise up a standard against the wicked. What is that standard? Verse 21 says, As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them, my spirit who is upon you, and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from your mouth of your descendants. Descendants, says the Lord, for this time and forevermore. What is it that shuts God's people in to his ark? What seals God's faithful? His Holy Spirit and his word. His Holy Spirit and his word. The good news is it says that it works through not only us, but our descendants and our descendants' descendants. So grandparents, hopefully you have children here today that are still walking faithful because of what God uh, has shown you and you've shown your children. I'm a fourth generation Adventist, but that really doesn't mean anything except for the fact that I'm still in God's word and that I plead for God's Holy Spirit to work in my life. There are fourth generation Adventists today who aren't in God's word at all. And don't pray for his Holy Spirit at all. So it's not because you're a fourth generation Adventist. It's because you're obediently living what you've been trained to live, what you've been shown from God's word. And when that time comes, the Spirit will seal you in. Just like God shut the door to the ark and sealed Noah and his family in, the Holy Spirit will be the instrument that seals God's faithful in. How do I know? Because the Bible tells me so in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1 and verse 13, it says this, In Jesus you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom you believed. 
you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory? How often do you plead for the Holy Spirit? Now, Jesus says in Luke 11 that he wished that we had asked for the Holy Spirit like a child would ask for food. And I would ask today, how often does a child want to eat? At least three meals a day, usually. Most of the time, my kids want to eat three meals a day or more. And Jesus said, I wish you would ask for the Holy Spirit like that. There are many today who don't even pray for the Holy Spirit once a day, but how, how should we be pleading for the latter rain? Maybe three times a day. Maybe four times a day. Maybe a snack time a day. But we should be pleading for the Holy Spirit, not just in our lives, but in the lives of our kids. And I think the reason why there's not a lot of pleading amongst our children is because parents aren't pleading for them. And their parents aren't pleading for them. We prayed for the latter rain this last prayer meeting. And it should be happening in our prayer meetings. And we talked, what is it that rain does to the earth? We said rain does two main things. It cleanses the earth and it grows the earth. And that's what the Holy Spirit needs to do to God's faithful people. He needs to cleanse us and to grow us. And it's not about growing in number. I'm not hoping that, man, I hope our church busts to 500 members and we have three services. It's not about that. There are plenty of churches that have lots and lots of members and lots and lots of services. There's plenty of churches that have Holy Spirit gatherings that aren't God's Holy Spirit. It's more amusement and entertainment than anything else, but it's not the spirit that teaches us to obey God's word, and to conform to Christ's character. But I thought, you know what? God wants to grow us to be like Jesus. God wants a people during the final dark hours of earth's history that shine bright for Jesus. His character is shining through them. Are we praying for the latter rain because we want to have a character like Christ when the world is full of a character of self and sin? Ephesians chapter 5, or chapter 4, verse 30 says this, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So how do we grieve the Holy Spirit? I'll tell you this, if you're grieving the Holy Spirit, you will not be sealed. You will not be sealed if you're grieving the Holy Spirit. Here's one way, this is the next verse, he's, he's, you grieve the Spirit. Let bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. If this is in our life, if we have bitterness towards people, if we gossip and have wrath and anger and are speaking evil of others, then uh, we are grieving the Holy Spirit. 32, this is what we would be doing if the Spirit was in our lives, and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ's sake has forgiven you. And then in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, it says, or 5.18, Do not be drunk with wine, and which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So what keeps me from being filled with the Holy Spirit? What is it that causes me to make him sad? During the flood, God, it says he was grieved at his heart. He was sad. He said, my Holy Spirit's not going to strive with men anymore. There's going to come a point in time where God's not going to strive with America anymore. He's not going to strive with the Adventist church. As far as when I say Adventist church, those people who have one foot in the world and one foot in truth. God will not strive with churches or Christians forever. You might say, well, why not? I want to look at two quick stories as we close up here today, found in Acts when he was dealing with the early church. Jesus had gone to heaven, and the early church in its infant stages needed the Holy Spirit more than ever. It couldn't have survived without the Holy Spirit. And you know what? We need the Holy Spirit today in our homes and lives, or we will not survive. Not spiritually survive. We'll be taken away in the flood of darkness. Acts 5, verse 1, it says, A certain man named Ananias with Sapphira and his wife sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? So who did Ananias lie to? Was it Peter? Yeah, I guess. That's not who he's accused of lying to. He said, you lie to the Holy Spirit. 
I wonder how many church members knew that Ananias had lied. Probably not many, maybe none. But God knew. And as I heard this story and read it again, I thought, man, as a youth, I used to think, how much did Ananias keep back for himself? We don't know. The story doesn't say how much he kept back for himself. Did he keep back 50% and say, okay, I sold, made a good profit in this land. I'm going to keep half of myself and give half to God? Maybe. Did he keep back 80%, give God 20? Maybe he gave God 10 and kept back 90. But let's say he gave God 90 and kept back 10. I gave God 90% and kept back 10. Would he still have lied to the Holy Spirit? Yeah, he promised the Holy Spirit he would give him all of this possession. And we sing as a church, I surrender all. We've sang it before. I've sang it before. And there are songs like it, and there are people saying, I'm committing all myself to God. But do we? Do we commit all of ourselves to God? What if we commit 95% of our lives to God, but hold back 5% for ourselves? Say, man, Lord, I'm only going to keep this one little habit, but I'll give you all 95%. Am I any different than Ananias and Sapphira? Ananias and Sapphira lost their lives. I will say this today. As God's remnant people, if you're not giving 100%, you will not be sealed. It's all or nothing. It's not, okay, God, I'll give you so much, but I'm keeping this part for the world. I'm keeping this back for self. It's all or nothing. And so really we can look at this story and put ourselves in there. Lord, am I different than Ananias and Sapphira? When I tell you I'm giving you all of me, do I give you all of me? Or do I hold back a portion for myself? Acts chapter 7. Verse 51. Stephen just finished preaching. He just finished preaching uh, a powerful sermon. This is a sermon to the pastors, so this is more to me. So I'm going to preach to myself. Elders, pastors, religious leaders, but it could be for anybody. But he said this to the church leaders. He said, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and in ears. Wow. You know, he probably could have come and shared that sermon at the GC. Not the GC, I'm talking about the NAD. (laughs) Wherever we had our meetings, he could come and share some of that. Because we keep doing things that are contrary, and yet we justify ourselves. And he says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised, you resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have heard become betrayers and murderers, whom you have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. What does it mean to be stiff-necked? It means you're not going to change. Your neck is going to stare straight ahead and doesn't matter what truth you're given. You're going to do what you want to do regardless. And if there are pastors today who's like, we're going to worship the way I want to worship regardless. We're going to move ahead the way I want to do regardless. It's like, well, here is truth. You know, there have been some faithful preachers that have preached truth to leadership that have been persecuted. I'm not going to get into specifics, but keep preaching truth. Maybe you've preached truth or brought truth to your pastor. And if you ever have something that you want to share with me and say, look, I don't know if the church is going the right direction here. Let's take it to the elders and let's pray about this. I'm not one who's like going to say, no, it's my way, the highway. And if that's the way I ever become, say, then it's the highway. Get out of here. It's God's way. It's not the pastor's way or the elder. It's it's God's way. His way is the narrow way, not the broad way to destruction. We don't want to do what all the other churches are doing out there. And he says, uh, you've always resisted the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to resist the Holy Spirit? Have you ever been woken up in the morning early and you're tired, but you just woke up and you thought, why am I up this early? I could read my Bible or I could get on Facebook for the next two hours. Maybe God's waking you up to be in the word and to pray for the outpouring of your spirit, of the Holy Spirit in your kids or in your church. I believe God's woken up, me up before and I've, I said, man, I want to go back to sleep. After a while, God will stop waking you up to pray. He's like, you keep resisting my voice anyways. Just sleep on. Just sleep on, Peter, James, and John. But if the Holy Spirit wakes us up in the morning, listen to that voice. Get into the Word and pray like you haven't prayed before. Say, I'm putting my phone away. I'm putting technology away. It's not time to get up so I can be on social media for a couple hours. It might be time to start putting social media aside as much as we can. 
If God convicts you of something in your life and you resist it and say, man, God's convicted me that I shouldn't be watching certain things. You know, in the days of Noah, it said one of the main reasons God sent the flood was violence. It says it in several verses, violence, violence, violence. There are so many Christians today who entertain their minds on violence. Almost anything that comes out, whether it be a movie or a television show, things that you, you see is all based on violence. You don't want to watch it unless there's violence. And I thought today of the first show I remember watching ever in my whole life, the first show I remember watching as a kid, five years old, was a little show called Tom and Jerry. Harmless, right? A little show called Tom and Jerry where the cat beats the tar out of the mouse and the mouse you know, beats uh, the living daylights out of the cat. And afterwards, me and my brothers would go beat the living daylights out of each other because we watched it. And by beholding, you become change. And I'm not blaming my parents. You guys may have watched it too as kids. I don't think they thought about it because as televisions began to creep in, it was a creeping compromise, and we didn't think about how that would affect us later on in life. But I'll tell you what, it went from watching an innocent cat and mouse to watching gun shows with cowboys and Indians and, and watching shows that had a lot more violence than that. And for going to my grandparents' house and you're watching shows like James Bond and A-Team and all kinds of shoot 'em up shows. And they got more violent and more violent, more violent, and it was okay. And there was violence in the land. And there was violence in our church and in our homes. We brought the violence right in. And maybe it I don't watch stuff like that. We just watch comedy shows, little sitcoms where husbands and wives are always at each other. No, 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 no. Maybe the violence is verbal violence where kids disrespect their parents. And most of those sitcoms, that's what you got. You got husbands disrespecting their wives, wives disrespecting their husbands, and kids disrespecting their parents. Violence right in the house. And it's entertaining and it's funny and we enjoy it. But maybe the Holy Spirit's saying today, look, some of the things that you've been entertaining your mind on, it's time to get rid of that. Because after a while, if you don't, you're not going to listen to the Holy Spirit anymore, and you're just going to keep doing it. And the sporting events that people love today, are they not violent? The most loved game in America, football, a very violent sport. People love it when guys bash each other and smash and tackle. The, the more violent they hit, the more they enjoy the game. There was violence in the days of Noah. And I know there are folks who hear this and like, oh, come on, give me a break. That's foolish talk. Well... The wisdom of the world is foolishness to God. And the foolishness of God way surpasses the wisdom of the world. As a church, I'm not talking about as a church corporate. I'm talking about as church families. We each need to evaluate what we've allowed into our minds and our lives, into the minds of our kids. Um, I want to close with just a couple more verses. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. So if you're sowing seeds of the world and doing all the fleshly lust of the world, one day you're going to reap the rewards. And the wages of sin is death. But there is a gift. And this gift is God's Holy Spirit. It says, I will seal you in. It says, but he who sows to the Spirit will reap, the, or of the Spirit reap what? Everlasting life. God wanted more than Noah and his family to live. He wanted so many more on that boat. Just like when I was on the boat, I thought, why was there only eight? I wish more would have gotten on. God wanted the same thing my sinful heart wanted when I was walking on that boat. But no one else wanted it. No one was, else was willing to let the Spirit lead them on and seal them in. And I wonder today, how many will be sealed by the Holy Spirit when darkness comes in like a flood? Or will we still be uh, amusing ourselves with the amusement parks of the world, the entertainment of the world? Um, God's not mocked. You don't know what happens in my house. I don't know what happens in your house. But God's not mocked. God knows. No one knew where Ananias and Sapphira, what they had done, but God knew. And so everyone has to give account for themselves today and parents for their kids. And I wish every Adventist church would have a message like this because every Adventist family, the time is short where the Holy Spirit soon will say, I'm not striving anymore. And each family, each individual, each person, maybe 12 and above, has to say, look, I'm going to make a decision today to be sealed in. 
I'm going to make a decision today for the Holy Spirit to seal me when the darkness comes in like a The darkness is already here like a flood. It is all over the place. There's wickedness all over the place. When you can go to a 4th of July parade, you know, it's interesting because when Pastor Follett came and said, hey, do you know what happened in, uh, where was it, Wisconsin or Texas? I don't know where the, what's, what's that? Highland Park, maybe it was in Illinois. But just a small little community where you have a, a person who goes in and shoots up a 4th of July parade. And I thought, as I was here, I was even thinking about that here. I thought, you know, are my kids safe being here at the 4th of July parade? You don't know. You don't know. There's no way officers can know every single person that's out there and what their mind has been influenced by and corrupted by. But the question is, if that should happen here, am I sealed and ready in case that did happen to me and my family? I hope, God forbid that should happen, that we would be sealed and ready. We don't know what tomorrow holds. Today is the day of salvation. You make sure that you're sealed today. Don't wait. Closing with this verse, Revelation 22, verse 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments. They may have the right to the tree of life and may enter into the gates of the city. Some versions say blessed are those who wash their robes. You're not going to have your robe washed if you're not keeping his commandments. Make sure your robes are washed in the blood of the lamb and you're keeping God's commandments. You will have the right to eat of the tree of life and enter into the gates of the city. But outside are the dogs. And the sorcerers, sorcery is so big in our nation. Everywhere you go, you walk into the bookstore and there's sorcery books. You turn on the social media, there's sorcery, sorcery, sorcery. And I've warned this, but my, my dad and I talked this last week. This is coming out by Christmas time. It's the Soul Phone app. And you'll be able to download that and talk to any dead person that you knew that you want to. And you'll pay to do that. They hope to have it out by Christmas called Soul Phone. Um, they've been working on it for years, but they're hoping to bring it out. And I thought, it's interesting how all this stuff is coming at one time. But it says, outside are the sorcerers. Is sorcery wrong? Absolutely. Are they be inside the gates? Sexually immoral. Is sexual immorality wrong? Yeah. But we just had Pride Month, and people are so pride and try to bash everybody who aren't pride. But here it says, it's not me. One day this, this page will be banned. It'll be ripped, ripped out of Bibles. But it says, sexually immoral people will be outside. Murderers, you'll be outside. Whether you murder with weapons or murder with your mouth. Idolaters, you'll be outside. And whoever loves and practices a lie. God's not mocked, but we sow, we will reap. If we wash our robes and keep his commandments, we'll reap eternal life. If we're like any of these people outside, we'll reap the same reward that they will reap. But the good news for today is, and verse 17 says, the spirit and the bride say, come. So today's God saying, come, get on the boat. Come, get on the ark. My spirit's still striving. It's, the door's open. Come. It won't strive forever. Once the door is closed, you won't get on. And tying yourself to the boat's not going to get you through. You're either in and safe or outside and not. But today, the spirit and the bride, that's God's church. So if you're sealed, you're to be calling other people to be sealed. Maybe we're not making the call because there's still people, God's like, man, I got to seal some folks in my church so they'll make that call along with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit and the bride say, come, let him who hears. So once you hear the message, your job is to call people to come. It says, let him who thirsts come. And I like this next part. Whoever desires, let him take from the water of life freely. Cost me 150 bucks for this ark ticket. Well, actually, it was for four tickets, not just for one. <clears throat> to get on God's ark cost you nothing. The Holy Spirit says, look, I want to seal you in. I'm going to close the door and I'm going to keep you safe from the power of darkness will come in like a flood and it's free. Come today while the Spirit is still striving because once the striving time stops and the door is closed, there'll be no more, um, there'll be no more possibilities for you to enter. Today is a day of salvation. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, do you want to trust him today? Do you want to serve him more and more? Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Let us stand Let us and pray. Stand. Father in heaven, today we are grateful for Jesus. 
and for the opportunity we have to plug into his power. Today, the Holy Spirit pleads with us because only through your power and through your grace can we live lives like Jesus. Only through your power can our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and give you glory. Only through your power can we be a city on a hill that will not be hidden. Father, today we want to ask for your latter rain in our lives individually and in the lives of our children and our families that we might be clean and that we might grow and be sanctified into the likeness of Christ. And Father, it's my prayer today that when the powers of darkness come in like a flood, we'll be found sealed and protected by your spirit. We'll be found sealed and protected by your word and we will not be moved. Lord, today it's my prayer that you will close us in like you closed Noah in on that ark. Protect us from the flood of darkness that will soon be on our earth. And this is my prayer in Jesus' name.